very special edition, on location edition of EWTN Bookmark with the one and only Father Benedict Groeschel. We're talking to Father Benedict about his wonderful books. One of them is I Am With You Always, his magnum opus. We'll spend most of the time talking about this book as well as a couple of other books, Travelers Along the Way and also Praying Constantly. Again, it's always wonderful to be with you, Father Benedict. And uh, be here, Doc. it's great to have you down here. We had the opportunity of taping this, obviously, during our family celebration. Some of our wonderful uh, participants are actually in the audience uh, observing this as we speak. But it's been so difficult to be able to get to get you down to Birmingham to uh, be on bookmark, but you write so much wonderful stuff and our EW10 religious catalog, I can't get enough of your materials and to make them available as these books are as well. But this book I know is really, really important to you, isn't it? And that is, I am with you always, a study of the history and meaning of personal devotion to Jesus Christ. And this is the interesting thing, for Catholics, Orthodox and Protestant Christians, why so? Well, first of all, I like Protestants and Orthodox Christians. I was always an ecumenical person, and uh, I've had many very positive experiences in my life, and I've often, in particularly in the ecumenical days, preached or lectured at Protestant churches and of uh, Orthodox, and in, in synagogues, too. I think I gave uh, lectures to at least 150 mm -hmm. synagogues. Right. That was the big thing, you know, 20 years ago. <coughs> Get somebody from the other side. Right, has that changed? Is it a good thing that it's changing? Well, unfortunately, sadly, the ecumenical thing was uh, blocked by a very sad thing, and that is abortion. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Church is clearly, absolutely opposed to abortion. A number of Protestant churches, and particularly Orthodox Jews and uh, some Orth Orthodox Christians, are equally mm -hmm. opposed to abortion. But unfortunately, sad to say, a lot of different denominations reluctantly and sadly mm -hmm. allow abortion. Well, let me ask you specifically about this book. You've written many, many books. I, I, I'm still not quite sure when you find the time to do it. But this book, you say, actually took you more than a decade yes. to do. Why did it take you so long? Did, was it finding the time to write? Was it gathering the materials? What was it? Well, it is a lot of research in this book, a lot of research in the history of Christian devotion. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, 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 unfortunately, the word devotion mm -hmm. and the meaning devotion back in the last, in the 80s and 90s and present, devotion was mm -hmm. poo-pooed. Little passe, right? You know, yeah. before that, it was a tremendous amount of devotion in the Catholic Church mm -hmm. to the Sacred Heart, mm -hmm. to the Blessed Sacrament, to the Blessed Mother, St. Joseph, St. Francis. And somehow or other, we got sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there was a, a playing down of devotion, particularly in Catholic higher education. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was sad. Uh, years ago, I used to uh, go to Fordham, and I was taking courses there, things like that as mm -hmm. I was a priest. And there was a beautiful devotion to the Blessed Sacrament in Fordham Chapel, beautiful, and it all kind of disappeared. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm hoping and praying that devotion is going to come back. Right. Now, one of the things you mentioned right in the beginning, you talk about the unique qualities of Christianity. And the first one is, it's the religion of the God who suffers and dies. Second, most of Christ's followers believe that Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, is still close to them. And then the third one is the one that has to do with the belief in Christ's presence, gives rise to Christianity's third unique characteristic, personal devotion to Christ. Now, I understand that as a Catholic, and I understand because I think of the real presence of our Lord, and certainly from the Orthodox perspective. But how does that fit in with the Protestant perspective, who do, where they don't believe in the real presence, but, you know, you hear about devotionals, but are devotionals different than devotion? 
Well, it varies, and it varies with Catholics as well. Uh, devotion is a very clear psychological attitude that Christ is present in some way in a reality individual to the person. And these are, this is based on the teaching of Christ, particularly in the Gospel of St. John mm. and on the eve of the Passion. Uh, those beautiful passages, I will be with you and uh, I will come back mm -hmm. and look for you. And he, it was right the day before he died. Mm. <coughs> and so in the very early church, there was a growing belief that Christ was there with us. Mm -hmm. Now, other religions that may be quite serious religions don't have that. Uh, you don't find that so t strongly in Judaism. Mm -hmm. There is another religion popularly does it, and that's Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't mean sophisticated Buddhism, but if you go to a Buddhist a monastery or a Buddhist temple, mm -hmm. you will see people kneeling before the statue of Buddha and they're moving their lips mm -hmm. and they're looking. They think Buddha is listening. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Buddha is not a god. Mm -hmm. He's a holy man. But they see him as a presence in their life. Mm -hmm. And that's devotion. Now, in Catholicism, uh, it's been very, very strong. Mm -hmm. And the church has encouraged mm -hmm. private revelations often about devotion. Mm -hmm. So the Sacred Heart, one of the most powerful devotions in the Catholic Church, that Christ appeared to the devout nun, St. Margaret Mary, with his flaming heart is there. And many Protestant people would say, well, what's, what's that about, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, but, uh, and uh, you take a life like St. Francis. He was deeply, deeply devoted to Christ. Mm -hmm. St. Francis gave us the Christmas crib. And he prayed there. And when you read the life of St. Francis, that night when he got the first Christmas gift, it says that he saw the Christ child right, right. there. Now you say this book is about Christian devotion, its meaning, its importance, and many varieties of expression. And that's what we're talking about. But you say, strangely, there is no generally accepted definition of devotion. But then you go on to say, when looking for a descriptive definition of Christian devotion, I turned to the account of the first recorded prayer the ascended Christ, the words of St. Stephen. What was that? Uh, I, saw the st the st I saw the heavens open and Christ standing. At the right. This is right before Stephen was killed. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a marvelous example of devotion right there. And remember, when Christ had ascended, they didn't have all these questions and answers. Right, right. Is he going to show up? And what, what happens? And how is soon it? is he coming? And he did right. show up. But physically, they could see him. And uh, from that very time, mm -hmm. with the apostles and the Blessed Virgin, that Christ would be there in the church. Right. And uh, I would say 20 or 30 years ago, Catholics were much more aware of the presence of Christ in their life. It's unfortunately, uh, it has somewhat died off, and we get a lot of people spending a lot of theological discussions and mm -hmm. theological uh, uh, point, points, and this one versus that one. Uh, what you are very blessed. I work with the poor people. Mm -hmm. I love poor people. And they have devotion, mm -hmm. not just Catholics. The, uh, the, if I could go in to a little 
store, storefront, black church down in Harlem, mm -hmm. the sweet Lord Jesus is dead. Right. And that's what you talk about, right. the sweet Lord Jesus. Well, do you t tend to think as well, I mean, I think about EW10, I think about Mother Angelica. Yes. I think one of the things besides, you know, obviously well, devotion to the real presence and the general devotionals, I mean, a lot of that was kept alive in a lot of ways, in absolutely. a very prominent way by EW10 and Mother Angelica, right? Oh, yes. Mother Angelica is a magnificent, magnificent example of a very intelligent, very perceptive person uh, who had a d deep devotional life, and thus, mm -hmm. I'm hoping to see Mother in a couple of days, right. and uh, I, she's well enough to talk to her. I, uh, I, she, she talks with her eyes, right? Definitely. And uh, I, I, I'm sure uh, the EWTN and right. the, uh, the sisters are, uh, and the friars are deeply, deeply. Right committed to devotion. Right, and I think there's at least anecdotal evidence uh, that's out there that, you know, where the vocations come out of parishes and dioceses, it's really where Eucharistic adoration and that yes. kind of devotion yes. has really been played up, right? And uh, unfortunately, devotion to the Eucharist was played down, mm -hmm. shot at, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I, I totally mm -hmm. uh, rejected that. And sorry to say, among the many different branches of the Franciscan order, which is founded by St. Francis, the most devotional person you could imagine, that kind of was played down. And uh, uh, to me, it's ridiculous. Well, you say we can define Christian devotion as a powerful awareness of or longing for Christ's presence and then you say, accompanied by a trustful surrender to him of our personal need. So there's, there's two components there. Well, in, in, particularly in mature devotion, mm -hmm. anybody who writes about devotion says that the important step of the individual is trusting mm -hmm. in God. And that's very, very much an important part. And uh, not too many years ago, there was a very strong belief of trusting in Christ, trusting in God. And uh, the great book, mm -hmm. Abandonment to Divine Providence by Father de Cossade, great Jesuit, that was mm -hmm. a, a very important part. And you know, uh, there was a great devotion in the Catholic Church after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. It, it, it was a very, after the war, there was a real religious revival, uh, I suspect, in the other churches as well. Mm -hmm. But in the Catholic Church, it was very, very much. Was that because of the great suffering that people had come yes. through from the and depression also, into the war? The, 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 and also the, the fear. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we were sitting over here waiting for the bombs to right, fall. Right, to fall on our head. When I was sure. a kid, we Duck were and having, cover, right? Yeah, we yeah. were having a, 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 what do we call it? Air, air raid drills, right? Drills yeah. three right, times exactly. a week. And, uh, uh, and you would see movies. Mm -hmm. when, yeah, sure. And uh, so we really were thinking about right. it. Now, you said doing the research for this volume has been a constant source of delight and amazement. Then you go on to say, the history of Christianity is not a trip to the land of Oz is integral part of the struggle of human existence. Christians fail, sin, do stupid things. They fight and kill others and kill each other. On a personal level, those who try to follow him sometimes go off the path. Yeah. Why is it important for us to understand that? Well, I don't want to mention, uh, there's a couple of re devout religious movements, not Catholic, give the impression that all will be well, all will be well. And uh, I don't find this realistic. Mm -hmm. It's a battle. And uh, the Christian life is, as St. Paul says, fight the good fight. Mm -hmm. And you gotta fight yourself, your own fears, your own cupidity, mm -hmm. your own sinful attachments. It's bonum certamen 
Chiritamen. Chiritamen, Chiritamen. Fight the good fight. Uh, Chirita in Latin is a fight. And uh, back uh, even 10 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, there was an awful lot of, uh, I would say, uh, uh, whipped cream <laughs> all over the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, it disappointed people. They all thought everything was going to be peachy. Right. And it did become peachy, yellow and soft. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so <laughs> A little too mushy. A little too Nothing mushy. Nothing to hold on to. Well, you know, one of the things that strike me, obviously, with this, this book, your magnum opus, it's a big book. And so, so people would, might look at it and say, oh, my Lord, uh, I love Father Benedict, but I like those kind of little books he writes. You know, those seem easier to me. But you actually, I guess, address that, because you actually put suggestions on how to read this book. Was that your idea, or was that the publisher's no, idea? No, that was mine. Okay. What you do is you look through carefully the index, the uh, contents, mm -hmm. and maybe read the introduction, and you pick out the parts that may be uh, meaningful to you. Let me see the book. Yeah, sure. Please. Uh, it, uh, uh, things uh, that would be particularly to people. Uh, for instance, there's a history of devotion uh, uh, from the apostles to the Middle Ages and then on to modern times. So for instance, uh, the spiritual renewal of France, mm -hmm. certain people, the Protestant renewal in England and in America. So the different faith groups might focus yes. on different chapters initially, sure. right? And uh, uh, the, the Protestantism did a profound influence religiously on the world. We Catholics, we arrived in large numbers only after the, uh, the Civil War, mm -hmm. and particularly after the Depression and very large cumbers. Well, the early Protestants were, they had been Anglicans, and the Anglican Church really failed them. There was no Anglican bishop mm -hmm. in the 13 colonies. They didn't want to encourage them. Mm -hmm. So there were no Anglican bishops, and you had to wait for Anglican clergy to come over. Well, they went on, and they went on their own, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there were a couple of Anglican bishops who didn't fit into the whole system. They were up in Scotland. And they came over and started ordaining Anglican clergy in mm -hmm. this country. In the meantime, the, the, the Protestants, Presbyterians, the Methodists, mm -hmm. later uh, the Baptists, each one of them, and each one of those uh, started their own kind of devotion. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you go around and have the opportunity to visit different Protestant churches, you'll see very different devotion. I always love to tell people to go to the African American churches. They have very, very beautiful devotion. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, Hispanic people who have drifted out of the Catholic Church. They're, they're, they were all Catholics. Mm -hmm. and they, but often in their devotion is very, very Catholic. It's still Catholic in yes. a lot of ways. Now, one of the areas since you talked about all the going through the centuries between the Orthodox and the Protestant and Catholic, one of the things I wanted to jump to because we only have so much time is you, you talk about Catholics in the 20th century and these two jumped out of me and you paired them together, and there's a reason for that, and you, Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen and Terence Cardinal Cook, you say these two men were both auxiliaries, bishops to Cardinal Spellman of New York. It would be difficult to find two clerics who had more in common in terms of devotion to Christ, but who were completely different in so many other ways. Yes, psychologically, were very different persons. Bishop Sheen, very gifted uh, speaker, a sharp person, kicked around, unfortunately, mm -hmm. to say, and yet uh, he was a devotional preacher. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I mean, I remember as a boy listening, we used to Sunday afternoon on the tele radio for Bishop Sheen, and wow. On the other hand, Cardinal Cook was not an eloquent preacher at all, but he was very much beloved by people in New York because he had such a gentle devotional life. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he was very, I remember when Cardinal Cook was dying, mm -hmm. the whole city went into mourning. Yeah. Not, <coughs> not just the Catholics, mm -hmm. everybody. Right. The uh, Cardinal Cook's funeral was a remarkable event. Mm -hmm. Well, you say Terence Cardinal Cook, who suffered from ill health for much of his life and from terminal metastasized cancer for his last nine years, believed a priest must be a servant, listener, victim, and friend. And you talk about devotion to Christ was the center of his life. And he didn't tell people, actually, he was as sick as he was, right? No, not that he did. He was dying, no. Oh. Uh, he was dying, was terminally ill at least mm -hmm. five or six years, if not longer. Mm -hmm. He had had cancer for 19 years. And uh, the last several years, it was metastasized. Mm -hmm. And he got a lot of tra treating, treatment. Right. But he never told anybody until he could not get out of bed. And you were very close to him. But you yeah. also point out that unlike Bishop Sheen, Cardinal Cook's most obvious fault was a dislike of controversy. Yes, he did not like uh, conflict. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, it was his personality. Uh, he, he did like, in New York, you know, mm -hmm. they all love to argue, right. uh, except Terry <laughs> Cook. And he was the most New Yorker of them all, born in, the, right. in Harlem, grew up in the Bronx. But he, uh, he, he could, anybody would come to have a fight with Cardinal Cook, they, they never got one. Right. Well, one of the things that struck me, though, in, in reading about, you know, you look about what happened, what Bishop Sheen went through, you know, and we talk about so many others, you talk about Mother Teresa and the others through the centuries, it always seems to be suffering, seems to be somehow central to all of this. Do you ever wonder whether that scares people away? They're, they're afraid of embracing the cross because they don't want to take on the suffering? Well, it is certainly one of the principal teachings of Christianity. Here is a religion whose founder and leading figure mm -hmm. is a person who died in crucifixion. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, now if, if you look, for instance, Buddhism, and I'm, I have great respect, the picture, the image of Buddha is smiling, mm -hmm. and a little of a heavy, you know, right, could, right. could use a couple of, take, <laughs> take up, Lose uh, a couple of pounds or yeah. something, right? Yeah, uh, the, uh, no, uh, Christianity is the religion of the cross. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when all is said and done, it's very realistic. Right. Let me ask you, we were just talking about I'm With You, always about devotion. One of the other books you've recently come out with is Travelers Along the Way, The Men and Women Who Shaped My Life, since you're talking about, we're talking about uh, Cardinal Cook, uh, who I think is also featured in here, and some others like Solanus Casey, Mother Teresa, uh, and also Father Eugene Hamilton. Uh, which we know about from the, the priest. Uh, but you also mentioned uh, this name. I'm not familiar with on page 97, a certain Mother Angelica. Oh, yes, <laughs> Mother Angelica. She's in there. So you got her in. You uh, said, I've always thought that Mother Angelica arrived on the scene precisely at the right moment. She did indeed. She got right there. And uh, amazing, uh, the bishops had tried to start a television mm -hmm. network with a good deal of money, and they couldn't do it. What bishop said to me, you know, we tried to start a network, and we couldn't do it, and this little old lady did it, you right. know. Well, you say, it is suffering transformed into prayer, and I believe it plays a large part in causing EW10 to continue to be the incredible experience it is yes. for millions of people out there. Yes, and immense numbers of people, uh, they have their own sufferings in life, and many of these people are not Catholics. Mm -hmm. The program itself, the, uh, the uh, station, is very Catholic. Mm -hmm. But lots of people 
right. uh, who are not Catholic. Right. Some are not even Christians. Right. But they, well, the truth is the truth, and the, the truth, truth transcends, truth. and Mother Angelica was espousing the truth. In fact, you talk about one of the times, just an experience we've all had who've been there, Mother's ability to talk, go on television and talk in a spiritual sense for an hour without anything in front of her. Oh, uh, and just uh, incredible. unbelievable communication uh, uh, skills. And something else Mother Angelica was known for was praying constantly, bringing faith to your life. We just wanted to touch on this book just before we went. Now, you talked about the fact in here that I was kind of surprised. You said that uh, when I was young, I must confess, I got myself in some trouble by trying to take the words of St. Paul just too seriously, well, maybe not seriously enough, but too literally. Yes. How so? I became scrupulous. Okay. You know, now, not too many people are scrupulous anymore, <laughs> but it was not unusual in those days for a teenager who was a devout teenager, a, a boy or a girl, they might be worried about sin. Right. And uh, they would be uh, often, you know, almost uh, self-defeating. Mm -hmm. And God bless the uh, spiritual directors, and especially in those days, the Jesuits mm -hmm. were very clear about that. Well, unfortunately, they are clearly telling me we are just out of time. We've it's always a pleasure. We always. covered a lot, hopefully. God bless your father. It was great to see you. And Speaking with uh, the one and only Father Benedict Rochelle, a special on location here at the EWTN Family Celebration, talking about three of his books, Praying Constantly, Bringing Your Faith to Life, of course, Travelers Along the Way, and The Men and Women Who Shaped My Life, and his big work, his magnum opus, it's I Am With You Always, a study of the history and meaning of personal devotion to Jesus Christ for Catholics, Orthodox and Protestant Christians, all available, of course, through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Thank you so much for joining us.